Good morning. Welcome to our morning message. Uh, this is Pastor Charles Lisey from Countryside Baptist Church. Uh, just want to wish you a good morning. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. As you're turning there, I just want to uh, share with you that starting next Sunday, we will start having uh, services at the church starting at 9.30 a.m. We will start with our morning service, and hopefully we will be continuing to meet on site. And I invite everyone who lives around our church uh, in our area to please visit. Um, we're not a very big facility, but uh, we can social distance to a fair extent, so we invite you. We invite you to, to come in fellowship with us and share in God's word. John chapter 18. If you want to read along, it says this. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Do you say this thing of yourself? Or did others tell it of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. To this end I was born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And then, had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find in him no fault at all. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for a chance to, to share in your word this morning. We just ask that hearts are open, minds are open, people are receptive to, to the message today. And I ask, as always, to keep my own wants, my own desires from tainting this message. May your word ring true. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What is truth? I heard about a guy, he had a bad encounter with this dentist. He didn't go to a dentist for several years, but, but finally he has a really bad toothache. And he goes in, and the dentist looks in his mouth and he says, I don't think I've ever seen a bigger cavity, a bigger cavity. And the guy says, hey doc, you've, I'm already scared enough. You don't need to repeat how big my cavity is. The dentist closes the man's mouth and he says, I didn't repeat myself, that was an echo. Probably a poor joke, but I can relate to that gentleman. I had fears of, of going to a dentist. I did not go for many, many years. <clears throat> I had a very bad one when I was young and just did not have a trust for him. But I did find a good one, one that told me what would need to be done and told me what would happen to my teeth and my gums if I didn't do what was needed. And it was years ago. I took his advice. I put my trust in him, and I've had no trouble since. What if the dentist hadn't told me the truth, though? Maybe he didn't want to hurt my feelings and tell me how bad things were. Maybe he didn't want to scare me. Didn't want to tell me uh, something that would upset me. Or even worse, what if he told me just what I wanted to hear? Or maybe he, you know, could have been a lazy dentist who didn't want to bother with taking care of my gums. He just wanted to, to get my money, look in my mouth, probe around a little bit, and, and you know, get me out the door. Uh, probably, if any of those things had occurred, I'd be missing several teeth by now. You see, there's two things you need to notice. The dentist had to be willing to tell me the truth, and I had to be willing to accept the truth. You know, society today, it suffers 
from truth decay. Just look at the world today, and Pilate's words echo back to us through time. What is truth? In today's world, we've bought this lie that as long as it works for you, then it must be true. Even though two people can completely disagree, they're both right. You know, there's a problem, though. Things that are different are not the same. Two plus two cannot both equal four and seven. You know, people, they want a world of preference, not truth. You see, truth is definitive, but preferences are not. Truth is factual. Preferences are opinions. Truth is provable, but preferences cannot be tested. Let's take a quick quiz. Uh, truth or false, or truth or truth or preference. Countryside Baptist Church is in Missouri. Question two: John Kennedy was assassinated. Question three: John Kennedy had the coolest hair of any president. Question four: Elvis Presley wore increasingly t tight white jumpsuits. Question five, Elvis Presley was the world's best singer. Question six, penicillin can unplug your drain. Question seven, penicillin fights bacteria. Question eight, blue is the best color. Now some of those statements were factual and some of those were preferences. You see, truth can be tested. It can be verified. Truth does not change. Truth should unify us. Preferences should divide. But the world that we live in is fallen. It is fallen. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 34 here in a moment. Truth does divide. Truth does divide. People want their truth over the real truth. And Jesus himself said that he would divide. Matthew 10, 34-36 says this, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter and the in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall they be of his own household. We want to get along, but Jesus divides. Jesus divides us from the world. He divides us from other religions. And often, he will divide us from those who claim to be Christian. Here's another quiz. Truth or preference, quiz two. Number one, same-sex marriage is okay. Question two. Christians should support and finance the building of mosques. Question three. It's not important if Jesus was born of a virgin. Question four. The resurrection was spiritual. Question five. Jesus was a God among many gods. Question six. Jesus and Satan are brothers. Question seven. Baptism must be by immersion. Question eight, the Lord's Supper must be held every third Sunday. Question nine, women should always wear dresses to church. And question 10, men in church should always have short hair. Now, any of those 10 could be a preference. Some of those will divide us. Others would not. Ultimately, where you draw the line will depend on your view of the Bible. See, after Pilate asked Jesus what is truth, notice he didn't stay and wait for Jesus to give an answer. John 18.38 says, Pilate said to him, what is the truth? And then he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find in him no fault at all. Perhaps if Pilate had waited for an answer, Jesus would have restated John 14:6, where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
If someone asks you, what is truth? Do you respond, Jesus or the Bible is truth? You know, if, if you do, you're going to probably encounter some who say, well, that's just an old name from an old outdated book. Others may say, sure, Jesus was a good teacher, but do you really believe he's God? And my least favorite, everyone knows there are errors and contradictions in the Bible. That one is one of my biggest pet peeves. Uh, being told that there's errors in the Bible, whenever I ask someone to point one out, the response I usually get is, is this dumb look, and then, well, it just is. Everyone knows that. It's a blanket statement. Everyone knows it. When you look at your Bible, do you see it as a book that contains truth, or is it a book of truth? If you say that the Bible contains truth, then you're also saying that it contains error. You see, everything that we learn about God, Jesus, salvation, it all comes from the Bible. And if your Bible just contains truth, then that lets you make preferences. You know, I like this, but I don't like that. I read once in a newspaper article about a, a family that they decided to, to form their own church, and they took bits and pieces out of everything uh, from the Bible and from other religions. And Jesus was part of their religion. And, and when asked, uh, why, why was Jesus? And they say, well, Jesus is full of love. We like that. If you believe the Bible is open to interpretation, then you're going to pick and choose what you want, like at a buffet bar. Regarding the Bible, according to the Mormon Articles of Faith, they state, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is correctly translated. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. Thus, since they see that the Bible has not been properly translated, they can take their own interpretations of the Bible and they can add new books to the Bible. Jehovah Witnesses, they created their own Bible translation, the New World Translation, and they issue from the, the Watchtower Society, uh, there's a magazine they put out, and, and the teachings in there, they place on the same level as Scripture. The Catholic Church, they hold to the Bible, but, but I don't... Catholics that I've met, and I know a lot of them don't read the Bible. Their view is that the average person can't understand it. And they they need their bishops and uh, to, to teach them what they need. The Catholic Church also holds that the, the Pope can speak ex cathedra. This, according to the uh, uh, Catholic Catechism, it says, the Pope when in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church. Meaning that the Pope speaks as the authority, the only authority, when there's a question regarding Scripture. And it is his decision that is to be taught then to the whole church. This has led to many teachings that are not scriptural, and the lifting of traditions as being on the same level as the inspiration of Scripture. I want you to note, in all three examples, it is man, not the Bible, that is held as the ultimate authority. Is your Bible truth, or does it just contain truth? How you answer that is going to affect your whole outlook on life. Let me give you some reasons why I fully trust the Bible. Uh, I'll address first contradictions. You know, I once had this view myself. I, I, I held to the idea that the Bible had errors, that it contained truth, but uh, that there were you know, things that just weren't right in it also. I no longer hold this view. Let me give you an example of a, a contradiction that, that, that bothered me at one time. Romans 4, verses 2 and 3, it says that Abraham was justified before God by faith alone. 
Now, James 2.21 tells us that Abraham was justified by works. That was when he placed Isaac upon the altar to be a sacrifice. So which is it? Is it faith or is it works? Well, we have to understand the context. Romans addresses Abraham's standing before God. Everything that Abraham did was through his faith. James, though, addresses Abraham's standing before men. Men saw how Abraham responded to his faith. His response was in doing works for God. There's no contradiction. One addresses his standing before God. One addresses his standing before men. Science. Now, the Bible is not a book of science, but where it addresses science, it is correct. For example, in ancient times, uh, you might ask the Hindus, what held the world up? And they would respond, well, the, the earth is held up by four elephants. Well, someone got to thinking, what's holding the elephants up? So they came up with this answer. Well, these four elephants, they stand on the back of a huge turtle. Well, finally, someone thought, well, what's the turtle standing on? What's holding him up? Now they, they came up with a new one, a, a, a coiled serpent. There's this coiled serpent that the turtle is standing on, that the elephants are standing on that are holding up the world. And someone... Again, finally asked, what's holding the coiled serpent up? And they came up with, it's swimming in this cosmic sea. If that sort of garbage was found in our Bibles today, people would be right to laugh at us. But instead, Job 26, verse 7 tells us, he stretches out the north over the empty place, and he hangs the earth upon nothing. None of this atlas holding the world up or elephants holding the world up. God places the world upon nothing. Now, history. To the best of my knowledge, no archaeological find has ever contradicted the Bible. Now, there was one time when skeptics claimed that Sodom and Gomorrah were just myths, that they never existed. And then truth started to be revealed. It started in 1969 with a little place known as Ebla. Ebla was discovered in Syria. No one even knew of Ebla outside of it being mentioned originally in some old Assyrian texts. But it turns out that Ebla was a major city of over 250,000 people. Over 15,000 clay tablets were found, and these tablets included trading records records that included trades with Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zibion, and Zyre. The same city is listed in the same order as found in Genesis 14, verse 1. Also, they found records of a flood story that closely resemble the Bible. They found that there were dealings with biblical prophets such as Abraham, Esau, and Israel, and in even later tablets that were found, they found mentions of individuals like King David and King Saul. And we've briefly looked at the topics of contradictions and answers, science, history. Witnesses. Witnesses. There's one more reason we can trust our Bible is because of the eyewitnesses to Scripture. In Second Peter 1, verses 19 through 20, Peter tells us, For we have followed for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we have made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses to his majesty. Peter is telling us that this isn't just something I heard about. This is something I saw. This is something I was a part of. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Luke writes, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order the declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them to us, from which 
the beginning were the eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you in order, most excellent Theophilus, that you might know the certainty of these things wherein you have been instructed. Luke is telling Theophilus in his writings that he's not writing about just things that he heard about, but things that he had eyewitnessed and that he himself had spoken to eyewitnesses. He'd interviewed them. And in Acts chapter 16, Luke actually joins Paul in his missionary journeys. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 through 8, it says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, and he was seen of the twelve, and after that he was seen of about above five hundred at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, and then he was seen of the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. Paul encountered doubters, and he is saying, check it out for yourself. There's a multitude of witnesses out there. There's over 500 witnesses. Yes, some of them had had fallen, well, he says fall asleep. Some of them had died by the time Paul is being questioned on this, but most of them are still out there. There are still roughly 500 people out there, four or 500 people who, who can testify to having seen the risen Lord. And he is saying, this isn't something I'm making up. This is something I was a part of. One of my favorite pastors, his name is Lodi Bauckham. He puts it this way. He says, I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They reported supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claimed that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. Written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, meaning that there were other people present when these documents were written And if they had been disputed, why wasn't there anyone writing out a counterpoint? Why wasn't someone debating this? Why wasn't someone saying it's not true? And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, he's saying, if you don't believe me, ask the other eyewitnesses. So, we have the the supposed contradictions that have answers. We have science that is supported Uh, by the Bible. We have history that is supported by the Bible. We have eyewitnesses. Ultimately, we have God's word, that he will preserve his word. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 18, For verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no ways pass pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And in Mark 13, 31 and Luke 21, 33, Jesus tells us, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Isaiah 48 tells us, 40 verse 8, The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. We have contradictions that have answers. We have science that supports the Bible. We have history. We have the eyewitnesses. We have God's promise to preserve his word. That should give you all the confidence that you need in your Bible. So does your Bible contain truth or is it the truth? If it is the truth, it points us to him who is the way, the truth, and the life. Hopefully, hopefully if you're asked if your Bible is truth or if it contains truth, the answer you give is that it is the truth. But as the old saying goes, actions speak louder than words. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. There are two times recorded when Jesus wept. The first was just prior to the rising of Lazarus. The second time was when he is making his final trip to Jerusalem and he sees the city and he weeps for the lost. Seeking the lost was foremost in Jesus' mind. 
He desired none to be lost. How about us? Do we see Jesus' urgency to save the lost? We see that Jesus was willing to die in order to save as many as would come to him. Do we have that same urgency? Do we weep for the lost? If your Bible only uh, contains truth, you don't feel an urgency. Perhaps there is more than one way to heaven. Jesus probably didn't mean it when he said, go out and reach all the world. Let me give you a couple of stories. First story deals with the, the Titanic. And at the time that the Titanic was sinking, it had just hit the iceberg. And within a few minutes of, of coming to the realization that the ship is not going to be uh, saved, Captain Smith, he, he brings the stewards to him. And... He tells them to to go out, go through the halls, knock on the doors, wake the people up, get them to the lifeboats. Some of the stewards believed the captain, and they went they went to the doors, and with an urgency, they told people, "The ship is sinking. We're in trouble. You need to get to the lifeboats." Other stewards, they didn't believe the captain. They, they had bought the lie that the ship was unsinkable. And so they either didn't tell anyone or they, they went to the doors and, and they came up with stories about, you know, to try and not panic the, the passengers that, oh, there's a lifeboat drill. At two in the morning, a lifeboat drill? Very few responded. And, and it, there's even records from, from the eyewitnesses' accounts on the Titanic when it was sinking, that some of the passengers got into the lifeboats, they decided it was too cold to be just sitting out there and that the boat was unsinkable, the, the Titanic, so they got out. They were in the lifeboats and they got out. The stewards that believed the captain, they went with a sense of urgency. They warned the people and the people got to the lifeboats. The ones who didn't, the, the stewards who didn't believe the captain, there was no urgency. They were not convincing. And people didn't go to the boats, and some that did thought it was silly to be in a cold boat when they could be in their, their, their nice warm cabin. And they got out. Let me share another story. Pastor John Harper was on the Titanic. He was traveling, uh, he was to take over the Moody Bible Institute. At the time that the Titanic struck the iceberg, he got his daughter into a lifeboat, and then witnesses say that he helped others into lifeboats. He was calling out women, children, and unsaved to the lifeboats. Four years later, a young Scotsman by the name of Aquila Webb stood up in a meeting in Hamilton, Canada, and he gave this testimony. He said, I am a survivor of the Titanic. When I was drifting alone on the spar that awful night, the tide brought Mr. John Harper of Glasgow, also on a piece of wreck near me. Man, he said, are you saved? No, I said, I am not. He replied, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The waves bore him away, but strange to say, brought him back a little while later. And he said, are you saved now? No, I said, I cannot honestly say that I am. And he said again, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Shortly after, he went down. And there alone in the night, with two miles of water underneath me, I believed. I am John Harper's last convert. John Harper knew the truth of the Bible and he knew the truth of what happens to those who are not saved. It is 
Our belief in the Bible give us a burning desire to reach the lost. When I started this message, I had the observation about my dentist. He told me what I needed to hear, and he warned me what would happen if I didn't respond. God's word is the same. It tells us what we need to hear and what will happen if we don't respond. I mean, God's word commands those who do respond that we are to go and tell others what they need to hear, and we are to warn them what will happen if they don't respond. And we should pray that they would accept the truth. The question now is, how do you respond? How do you respond? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we ask you to help each of us to be like those early Christians, to, to tell it like it is, to serve you with conviction. Help us to know discernment, to know when to separate from those who would lead us astray. Help us to grow in our knowledge of your word, to know the truth and to stand firmly upon your truth. Help us to be pleasing in your eyes and help us to have compassion on others. And give us the strength to have faith in your word and to feel the same urgency that Christ felt when he came to seek that which was lost. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed this message, please subscribe to our channel and share this message with your friends. Again, next week, January 24th, Countryside Baptist Church will begin holding services again on site. Our morning service starts at 9.30 uh, with Bible study uh, starting shortly after the morning service. We are scheduled to have our quarterly business meeting uh, on Sunday. There are several things we need to cover. I will be providing pizza for those who attend the meeting. Uh, that concludes our announcements. I invite those of you living near Countryside visit to uh, Countryside Baptist to visit us next Sunday. And until then, may the Lord bless us and watch over us until we meet again. Amen and God bless.